right, guys, we're, ooh, sorry, that's loud. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we've got a great night ahead of us, and uh, I'm really looking forward to the conversation. I'm Marcy Perez. I'm with Chrysler and also your VP of the board for 313 Digital. So if I haven't met you yet, um, I apologize. I'll, I'll be around afterwards. Um, again, we have a, a great night here, and it, it all couldn't um, have happened without our wonderful sponsor, um, Genome. So we thank you for coming out and helping make this happen for all of us. Um, there's also a bunch of folks out there on the board that I want to thank. Um, Sorry, I have my notes here because there's quite a few. Um, Holly Wernett, Diane Brody, Jim Ryan, Amy Kincaid, and Michael May. Um, you guys have put a lot of work and hours into this, and um, we really appreciate it. It should be a good night. Uh, as one of my friends over at Microsoft likes to say, data is sexy. So um, uh, I'm sure we're up for a really interesting conversation. Terrible um, evidence. This is a sold out event, so we appreciate all of our members and non-members that have uh, decided to come out tonight, and uh, we have a lot of good events coming up in the future as well, so uh, keep posted on our website, and uh, we hope that you can come out to other events. Um, I hope you all got something to eat, because the, the truck should be leaving soon, I think, and uh, please remember to tip your bartenders, they're um, doing a good job out there. Uh, without any further ado, I get the privilege of announcing our uh, moderator for the evening. He comes to us all the way from New York. He is the VP of Sales for AOL's Audience Targeting, and we have uh, Jeff Hochberg with you tonight. So, Jeff, come on up. It's the first ovation I think I've ever gotten. Thank you. Can you, all, can you all hear me? Yeah. All right, good. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, I just want to thank you all very much for the, uh, for the opportunity to be here tonight and to moderate tonight's panel. Um, just by way of introduction, I am Jeff Hochberg, the VP of Audience Targeting Sales at uh, AOL, Ad.com, and Huffington Post. I've been with the organization for about 13 years, having spent the first nine or so uh, on the ad.com side and uh, for the last four years I've been managing the audience targeting group. Um, uh, in case anybody's interested, I'm a, a, a big Nationals fan, big Redskins fan. Sorry about the, uh, the Tigers lost today, although they did get the win last night. <laughs> Sorry guys. Uh, I am rooting for them to make it to the playoffs though. Um, I have been, uh, for the last month or so, I've been thinking about a, uh, a way to kick off today's discussion and just looking for uh, sort of like any witty intro. Um, you know, I thought about how I could incorporate Prince Fielder or uh, The Worm and the 1980s Detroit Pistons uh, or Megatron, and I came up with nothing. Um, sorry. And, uh, and so I thought about maybe like taking a chair and putting it next to me and having a mundane conversation with, uh, uh, with nobody like my man Clint Eastwood and realized that it didn't work too well for him, so it probably uh, won't work for me either. Uh, so instead I figured that we would just talk about tonight's topics. Um, the title of tonight's panel is The Evolution of Big Data. And I read that. And I think to myself, what does it mean? What, you know, what, is, what is data? What is big data? Uh, is big data different than uh, small data? Is there such thing as small data? I don't even know. Um, uh, I know what I think it is. Uh, I know that everybody here probably has their own opinion as to what it is. But I think the fact of the matter is that we all probably speak a different language when it comes to data. Everybody has their own opinion. Uh, there aren't necessarily standards set in place. Um, the good news is that tonight we're going to hear from some of the more formidable minds in the industry um, asking them what they think about big data, what they think big data is and how it applies to making decisions as it pertains to, uh, uh, to marketing and to marketing online. Um, what we'll do tonight is to try and generate a dialogue among uh, myself and the panelists and hopefully the audience as well. Um, we'll talk about topics such as uh, data providers, different tools and platforms, um, 
uh, how we use both data and the tools and platforms to make these marketing decisions. We'll talk about analytics and attribution. Uh, and if we have time, we'll talk about how the, uh, the notion of privacy factors into all of this as well. Um, we'll try to keep some semblance of structure to the conversation. We have, I think, according to the schedule, we have 90 minutes. Uh, I, I can't imagine that uh, I or anyone else up on the stage for that matter um, can keep your attention for that long. Uh, so what we'll probably end up doing is uh, having our discussion for uh, maybe 50 minutes and then opening it up for uh, Q&A. Um, uh, with that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to the panelists to introduce themselves, maybe take a minute to talk about them, their role, uh, and the organization uh, within which they work. So, I guess, Eric? Okay. Um, hi, I'm Eric Rosa. I'm CEO of Data Logics. We are a, uh, a big data company, I guess. Um, we're based in, uh, in Colorado, and uh, very pleased to say we've recently opened our, uh, our Detroit office in, uh, in Birmingham. Big press release yesterday. And, um, oh, I'm sorry. Should I? Is that what we want? Should we be passing the mic here? Is that better? Is that better? Okay, sorry. My name is Eric Rosa. I'm CEO of Data Logics. Very happy to be here from our headquarters in, in uh, Colorado, joining a couple of my colleagues who are here. Um, I, again, some of you already heard this, some probably didn't. We, we recently announced the opening of our, uh, of our Detroit office in uh, downtown Birmingham. Very excited to be here. And Data Logic's focus as a company is on connecting the dots between digital media investments and offline sales, which obviously is where virtually all vehicle sales occur, and it's where about 90% of consumer spending happens overall. And uh, had the great pleasure as a kind of as a, as a company and as a professional to work with, um, I think everybody up here um, on the panel today, other than John, whom hopefully we'll be doing stuff with soon as well. No pressure, John. No. Hi, uh, my name is Peter Foster. I'm the GM of uh, Genome from Yahoo. Uh, I've been at Yahoo for about a year and a half uh, as a result of the five to one acquisition. Um, and a long and sorted career in the audience and performance space, uh, spanning back to companies for you old schoolers in the, uh, in the uh, crowd like L90 and ValueClick, FastClick. Uh, so I've been around this space for a fair amount of time. Uh, based in San Francisco, just for clarity, I did grow up in Chicago, so I hate the Niners as much as you guys do, especially after last weekend. So you gotta, you gotta play to the crowd. Well done. Uh, we won't talk about the Bulls. Um, but uh, really happy to be here. Obviously, we have a huge presence here uh, as Yahoo and as Genome, um, and have, have recently hired quite a few uh, more into the, into the space as we start to delve into some of the questions uh, around what we're going to do with audience at Yahoo and what we're going to do with the InterClick acquisition, which has uh, morphed into uh, what we're bringing to market uh, as Genome uh, starting in July. So uh, looking forward to the conversation, and uh, thanks for having us. My name is uh, Doug Pollock. Uh, I'm from Lodemy. Lodemy is a data management platform, uh, primarily. Uh, I've been with the company for over five years. I'm based actually in Columbia, Maryland. Uh, and pretty much what I do for Lodemy is I head up uh, their, uh, a lot of the operations of the platform in addition to their data product. Uh, so uh, we do offer up, um, to the, the gist of what we do is manage first party data for our clients. Um, in doing so, we also provide third party data for them to overlay on top of their first party data. So I head up the, the third party data component and then also a lot of the operations of the actual platform. My name is John Gray. I work at Team Detroit and uh, happy to serve on behalf of clients like Ford Motor Company and others. Um, I work within the digital function and mostly around digital media planning and buying. Uh, the only thing I want to say first is that I'm going to reserve the right that I'm going to voice my opinions tonight um, because I think some of them may be controversial and so what I don't want is everybody to come back in and, and meet with the teams and say, well, we know Ford's strategy is this um, because I, I've worked across a diverse set of clients over the uh, past decade or so in this industry. 
um, and that's shaped a lot of what I really passionately believe in, uh, and that's what I hope to share with you guys tonight. So hi, I'm John Beebe. I'm the Director of uh, Digital Advertising and Analytics at General Motors. I've been there for a year and a half, so I'm kind of a newbie there. Um, what I do is I uh, partner with our divisional brands globally to help them develop digital marketing campaigns uh, that are very holistic, so looking across all of the digital disciplines. And then the other part of my organization kind of helps measure the performance of that. Um, I'm really excited to be here to talk about uh, big data because I think there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of buzz and a lot of misconceptions about it. Uh, but I ditto what John said, like anything I say tonight, uh, it's not GM, it's me. Um, because I actually like my job. I actually volunteered to wear a shot collar just in case I said something that was like company secret, right? Uh, but really, you know, tonight I think part of my role is to be able to be a provocateur and be critical and skeptical because we get calls all the time from, you know, potential partners saying we can do this, that, or the other for you. And being able to look at that with a healthy dose of skepticism and criticism and uh, also in some instances, you know, we're just the dumb client that doesn't understand. Um, and so being able to challenge uh, the opinions here, I'm, I'm not going to be a jerk, but I hope we do go a little Jerry Springer tonight. So <laughs> I'm excited. So I don't know if that makes me Jerry Springer or not, but uh, uh, I think that's a good segue. So what I did, one of the ways in which I figured that we could structure tonight's conversation was I spent some time uh, online Googling or AOL searching, if you will. Uh, uh, what's so funny about that? I, you know, come on. Uh, uh, I spent some time on the internet searching for, uh, for, for quotes or for interviews from, uh, from the panelists. And one of the ones which I thought would be a logical uh, place for us to kick it off was, came from John Beebe, and it was a, an interview that he did uh, for a, a, uh, an event called ARF Research Now Live, where he stated that people don't understand what big data means. No one has figured out how to bring it all together and to make sense of it. Um, I think that that's a, probably a relatively valid statement and the premise of the, the whole evening. So uh, to kick it off, my question for the group would be, nobody in particular, uh, what does big data mean to you? Um, how are you using it to impact the decisions that you're making, making on behalf of your clients? Uh, how does it factor into your daily routine? Um, I don't know whoever wants to take a shot at it first. I can jump just to that. Sure. sure. Um, I'll jump on that because of the quote in the context they were asking, um, you know, what are buzzwords in the industry that drive you nuts? What are the most annoying buzzwords in the industry? And, and candidly, big data is one of the biggest annoyances that I hear on a daily basis. Um, and the reason I believe that people don't really know what it is, is uh, it's complex, uh, unfortunately complex. Big data has a lot to do with IT and information processing and taking a lot of different variables, or at least to me, it's, 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 a, it's more of an IT and an analytics discussion, while the, the beneficiary of what's happening on the back end, it's highly technical, is marketing and is media planning and is media buying. So for me, it's taking all of these multiple variables, combining them together and making sense of them. And um, I think the real struggle is there's a lot of buzz about it. There's a lot of uh, misperceptions about what you can do with all of this data in real time. And I, I know... A lot of us are talking about DSPs and DMPs, and what I find fascinating is there are some limitations to the types of processing that happen just based off of the technology on the back end. And I think we're expecting a silver bullet in the digital space, and I think sometimes we're just jumping on the bandwagon with another buzzword. That's fair. Uh, <laughs> so I, the, the only thing I would add to that, um, I think you're right, right? Big data is a, you, you mentioned Hadoop earlier, should we take a poll? We should. Yeah. How many people in the audience have heard of or know what Hadoop is? We can't see. Good, right? Doesn't really matter, right? To John's point. Um, what matters is that we're in a position right now where uh, we have an opportunity to move from a marketing environment where data was very fragmented, hard to access, and for the most part, pretty descriptive uh, in terms of how you were going to buy media, what did an index look like, uh, you know, what audience was a particular TV show or magazine reaching in general, uh, on average. And we're able now in a digital world to make that predictive, to make that actionable. And whether the data is sourced through 
you know, Hadoop or other technologies or how we're sort of bringing all that in, we're all in a position here as marketers to try to figure out how we take all the disparate companies and all the affiliations that we each have and make everything that we know about users actionable online, um, both from a descriptive perspective um, that can be taken and, and applied to all the marketing uh, strategy of a particular client, but also specifically actionable, right? I know who that user is, I know where they're gonna be, I can find them and I can talk to them in a very, very personalized way. And using that, um, you know, moving from, from uh, a, a, a descriptive to a predictive world is really what all this is about, right? Everything happens so much faster. So how do we do that? Uh, Eric, sorry. Do you wanna ask or you want me to go? No, you go ahead. Okay. Um, so I actually agree with both these guys, so no, no fisticuffs yet up here. <laughs> but, you know, I would say for big, the big data, is re, it's, the real job is to kind of harness massive amounts of information and use it to inform decision making. So if you're not ultimately using it to change or to have the potential to change what you might do otherwise, it's really just it's really just window dressing. We think of kind of our job because we're specifically focused on a, a, a you know a sub challenge of big data, which is combining massive amounts of offline and online data, which involves real time decisions or real time uh, information flows in the online world, that massive batch information flows in the offline world. In the offline world, you've got PII. In the online world, you've got anonymous cookies, all these things. So we think of what we do in kind of what I call the four A's, which are we, we have to aggregate the data, we then have to on, anonymize it, we have to perform analysis, and then to, just to echo what Peter just said, we have to deliver actionable insights, and every one of those tasks is as important as the others. And so, but at the end of the day, I think it's, the last thing I want to say is it's about informing decision making, because at the end of the day, because it's such an imperfect science and things are so early, you can't just blindly trust what the data is saying right now, and we, we see that every day as well. So, so, so what are some of the tools that, uh, that we as an industry are using to make them, make the data actionable, to anonymize it, to bring it to market? What, uh, you know, ha have there become standards? Uh, what, what are some of the tools that we're using to do this? Um, so first up, no, no standards anywhere that, I, <laughs> that I've seen. Um, in, in terms of some of the tools, I mean, look, we, we do everything from that the very, very raw, like cookie log processing, um, but we use data in ways, I think like Eric mentioned, to answer specific questions. So what, what we tend to do is uh, we tend to come up with a hypothesis and we then go and we look through the data um, to help in, interpret whether or not that is actually uh, the case. And then if we don't have enough information, we then start to develop a test scenario or test case to, to say, all right, well, if it's not in the data set today, what can we do to get that information into the data set? Um, oftentimes, actually, I think we're in a position where it's really about taking different data sets and combining them together to uncover new patterns of information is probably how we use it most. Um, and really, you know, test a lot of what I would say are, are you know, best practices or, or tried and true principles that we've lived by in this industry for a long time um, and improve them false and try to get smarter. So think about things like last click attribution and how that guided this industry for so long and actually drove a lot of what are really, really terrible practices out there um, in behavioral targeting. Um, you know, it, it actually drove a lot of sort of the early machine learning that was happening because all it was doing was taking advantage of last click attribution. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in some ways it's good because it, it drove some technology development, um, but in many ways it, it was bad. So, so back to the, the how we use it in, in the tools, um, you know, I think most people out here have reporting systems uh, and, and you mine that data in different ways, um, but I think it all needs to start with that business question that you're trying to answer. Um, and that's how you would, you would apply it effectively. So my, my shameless plug alert here would be that I think one of the tools is a data management platform. Um, I think that's, I mean, exactly what he just said about bring, combining data together, that's what a DMP does. Uh, are we necessarily at the point that, that 
you know, John was saying where you can take in all the data and analyze it in real time and make it actionable in real time, probably not. There, there probably needs to be some time from a technology standpoint. Uh, but that's the goal, and we're able to actually bring in all of the data from everywhere, uh, you know, to, to data logic to this point, offline data. It doesn't matter. Any type of data, uh, the, the, the conversions, no matter what data there is, you can bring it all together into one system, and you can analyze it in multiple ways. So that would be the tool, or one tool that I recommend at least, but again, that's kind of a, I'm biased a little bit, it's a shameless plug, but that, that's one tool, I think. So the only thing I would add to that um, is uh, to, to your point about standards. Right? Um, I've been in a lot of meetings where we debate the relative validity of social data or purchase data or first party data or third party data or uh, sort of anything in between. Um, and, and, and our perspective certainly coming um, out with, with our approach is we want all the data we can possibly get into our system. Um, from any one of, uh, of, uh, of the sources that are available, including the, the folks here up on the panel, because at the end of the day, the more facts you have um, eliminate um, the occurrence of false positives, it eliminates um, really that, that question, right? If you're inputting a lot of data into building an audience or analyzing something that you think is going to be pre predictive against, against uh, a future campaign, the more data points you have, the, the, the ones that are true, clear signals are going to rise to the top. And that, by proxy, probably makes them uh, more valid or, or more consistent data sets. But that's almost not the point, right? We want to bring in as much in as possible and find out what's a clear signal for what advertiser. And how do you determine what is a clear signal? Uh, you know, what, what's the, you're bringing, the, you, you talk about bringing in all the data that you can, uh, understanding out of that data, uh, what is providing a, a quote unquote clear signal uh, directing you towards some sort of um, positive action? How do you determine what those signals are? I'll, I'll take that one. I'm sure there's a wide variety of, uh, I started this, so I'll, I'll answer that question. Um, so uh, again, to the, to the point of more data, we, we talk a lot of, at Genome, and this is really coming from the, from the interclick culture, we talk a lot about starting at the finish line. Right? Rather than starting with, a, hey, we have an in-market auto intender, right? which could have been collected from a, a, a wide variety of places and might be a perfectly valid signal, we start at the end. We talk to clients about um, taking a look at, you know, via pixel or data integration, what the clients that are doing what they want them to do actually look like across thousands of data sets. And what comes out of that, obviously, is commonalities. If you only have three or four pieces of data on a group of users, you might get a lot of false positives. You might get a lot of overlap. Mm -hmm. Gender, for example, probably not a great indicator in a, in, a, in a lot of cases, but it might be a strong signal when combined with a bunch of other things. So we look a lot at, at those things and we say, listen, these are the things that the folks that you have actually have in common. That's the first part. Mm -hmm. The second part is then you got to go out and see how that performs against different kinds of media and different times and different um, creative strategies. All that comes together and will continue to inform what's causing the behavior that you want. It won't just be audience. It'll be a combination of audience and context and data. Mm -hmm. But you've got to start with looking at, uh, at, at the customer that you're trying to replicate mm -hmm. uh, in as broad a set of data as you, as you possibly have. So th therefore, you, you eliminate, you, you get to the causation rather than the correlation. Mm -hmm. Smaller data means correlation. More data means you have actually a, an ability to pull out what's actually causing the behavior. I think I agree to an extent. I think we as marketers, we have plenty of data. I mean, data is getting pulled into countless DMPs and countless databases all over the place. And to me, just as a counterpoint, I think we have too much, candidly. But, and we're reading into data and making a lot of assumptions based off of a number of variables. And we're f so focusing on, perhaps, sometimes we're focusing so much on the science portion of it and the actual um, what we're seeing through clickstream data or otherwise that we're missing kind of out on the the art side of it. Um, it's, it, and I know there is, you know, there's, I'm a big fan of both. I think the challenge is you can get caught up into all of these multiple variables that explain all sorts of things. You know, this person went online and searched for preparation age, you know, and they did this, that, or the other, or they're, they're doing this, or they're doing that. And it doesn't always tell the full, you said it right when you said, 
taking the context into account, because I think that's really key as marketers. We can have so much data and we can look at so many variables, but until we actually put it into context and put that lens on it to see what's really happening, I'm looking up preparation H for my mother, you know, why? I don't know why, but, um, <laughs> you know, but you gotta be careful with the types of variables that you're looking at. I know, right? Um, you have to be careful at the number of variables that you're looking at and don't make so many assumptions. And I think that's where the human element of it and we as marketers come into play. We can't just take a ton of data and assume that that's gonna be the magic bullet that connects all of the dots. Um, so I think we have to find a balance there because we have so much data, but the insight portion of that and actually one of the biggest benefits of big data is that you can at instantly, you can look at a ton of data. The biggest setback to that is you can't analyze it. You actually have to have a human go in there and look at it. So, so real quick, uh, I'm actually like a former statistician and, and so you would think that I would disagree with you, but I actually 100% agree with you. Uh, I, I think I'm very much a big fan of using data to inform decisions, but not making decisions solely on data. You need to look at it, analyze it, make sure it makes sense, combine it with other things, 100% agree. I also think a big issue with data is the accuracy of the data. Uh, I, I think, um, I hope not for, for you guys over at GM, but, but I think a lot of times people bring in all, uh, as much data as they possibly can without looking at where the data come from, is it accurate, you know, and it, it's, it's, I'm sorry? How duplicative it yeah, is. Yeah, and, and that's another big point. Yeah, how duplicative it is. Uh, so it's another thing that we really have to look at. It's just making everything a little more accurate in how we're analyzing it. I learned something, um, I've, been, I've been in my current gig for about six years, and I learned something um, probably about four years ago that, that I found really valuable, and this gets into what makes data big data versus small data, which is as much as possible, go to the granular. One can get totally overwhelmed and impressed by billions of records of this and gazillions of records of this. And so what I do, we have, um, we have the interesting... Um, uh, scenario again of sitting between offline and online worlds, but as we bring in these big offline databases for the biggest retailers and Polk Automotive and financial services companies and all that, these at the end of the day, they start as offline files and they have a name and a postal address or an email address. So what I do now is I will actually look at my own record in these databases and those of my employees and it doesn't matter how big a data set is. You can, and you can do this, obviously you can do this online too because you can look at your own cookie or those of your employees. You learn so much by looking at that. And I, very early on, um, uh, we, we, I, I used that, I guess, as a competitive advantage for us. I said, I'll show you in a meeting what your own data says. No other data company that I knew would say that, right? And so I, I just find, I found that incredibly valuable because it's easy to get overwhelmed with the, quanti with the quantity of data and, and I think as all these guys are saying, the quality is very spotty and, it's, and there's absolutely a garbage in, garbage out thing. And in my, as we are acting as a pipe for a lot of third party data sets, over 1200 different third party data sets, we are getting garbage in, everybody is. And so your job as a big data company or a company working with big data is actually to learn how to filter that. And so I just encourage you guys, I think maybe that's one takeaway is get to the granular and ask the questions and dig in. And it's, it's hard, but it's not impossible in any data set to actually look at individual grains of sand and say, does this look reasonable or not? And you learn a ton. So the, it, there was a, uh, an ad exchanger article last month. Uh, it, was, it was titled, Lines are Blurring Between DMPs and DSPs. And it stated, behavioral targeting in the right context is an excellent predictor and locator of who are apt to buy something. Uh, fast forward to, I think it was Monday this week, Jim Spanfeller took a more critical approach to the same concept, uh, and he stated, BT is, a one uh, BT is one dimensional uh, in what it does for a brand. While hyper-targeted through the increased use of cookies, the ad itself might exist in a place that isn't magnifying the product offer. What companies should consider is the platform where the ad is living. Uh, is it in a place where users are thinking about the product genre? Uh, is the content, sorry, is the content of a quality that your brand is willing to neighbor? So we talk about uh, it's not just about the data; uh, it's about the context and the content. I think that that's uh, um, uh, that, that's what these quotes are saying. Does that? Um, well, two questions. One is, do we have any, do we, you, any of us here at the, uh, on the panel, have any empirical data which actually proves that there is value in buying um, 
uh, data, buying users, buying audiences uh, within content or context over just uh, straight programmatic buying? Uh, uh, ab absolutely. But first off, when we do programmatic buying, we also take into account context. So that's one of the variables we look at. Um, but I, I think BT is, is probably one of the, the biggest lies out there. Um, in fact, when you look at um, auto intenders in general, and this sort of comes back to you know, where, you, where the source data comes from, uh, because I can't tell you how many times I could go to 10 different sites and say, hey, I'm trying to reach auto intenders, you know, sm small sedan intenders on the West Coast, you know, what type of inventory availability do you have? and the numbers that come back are outrageous. I mean, tens of millions of users, uh, and when the entire market's not gonna sell you know, more than 14 million cars, you, you just know it's not true. Right. Um, and so, you know, first, it, it is interrogating that data. Um, it is applying that sort of human logic to it um, overall. But yeah, I, I think that's sort of one thing that we've done a disservice, is not really questioning all of that and finding out where the source data is. And, and none of this is perfect. We talked about data accuracy. Go to your own credit report. Uh, I mean, mine, one of them, one of the providers says I'm retired. Uh, and, and while I hope that's Lucky true someday, yeah. While I hope that's true someday, um, it, it's, it's absolutely false. You know, my, my wife gets uh, catalogs uh, that says Reverend uh, Lisa Gray, and I have no idea why that happened. Um, you know, and, and actually, I may call you up because that may be something that you've done to me. But um, so it, it's you absolutely have to, you know, apply that filter. And you guys, are, you all know your businesses. You know your clients' businesses. You're much smarter. And so start with the hypothesis and use the data to interrogate it and, and move on from there. You, you, yeah. you John. Oh, sorry. So, so I, I just want to play on that for a second, the, the context piece. So um, I, I agree with everything John just said, and data validity aside, I mean, to some extent, that's almost the role of the DMP these days, is to input a lot of signals and create segments, and, and, and you know, these guys spoke well to that. But Genome works uh, as a managed solution, but by combining signals from creative, supply, therefore environment context, as well as audience and providing analytics and actionable insights out of that, we absolutely feel strongly, um, and we see it every day in every campaign that we run, that media performs differently, uh, not just in general, but for different advertisers, for different audience segments, for the same advertiser. Um, it's a critical component of, of what we do and what all of you guys, I'm sure, are doing. Um, but I would say one thing that I think is important that I think, a lot, I think we've lost, which is, uh, Genome, when we're running a campaign, we own an exchange, right? We theoretically can bid as much as we want on our own supply. We source a relatively small percentage on a purely bidded basis. We buy a lot of uh, above the exchange uh, supply from our supply partners. Uh, we buy on exchanges. We buy programmatically through partners like AOL and Microsoft. But um, the notion that data and bidding are exclusively linked is a huge, huge miss in this, in this space. Because the notion of programmatic doesn't necessarily mean bidded. If we all have data, first party, third party, whatever we want to believe, and we're not using that to make every piece of media that we buy as smart as we can make it, we're missing the boat. Which means if you're buying guaranteed supply from Yahoo, and, you're not, uh, and we're not leaning forward and trying to figure out how you can sequence creative based on what you know about your customers, that's a miss for us. Mm -hmm. um, but if you think you're only going to hit your audience on the quality of supply that's in exchanges, only going to bid against everybody else, you'll never know quite how much you're going to win, that's a miss too. Mm -hmm. So all of this should inform every source of media that you have access to. It shouldn't just be bidded data and nothing else. So can I jump on that for yes, just a please. sec? Uh, and because we talked about this example publicly, I, I could share some of the details. but. Um, we, we couldn't agree more, and it's really, we use a lot of this technology around real-time audience segmentation and then doing smart things with that. And so as an example, one of the things we've done with a bunch of the in-market sites is, um, you know, you, you sell sponsorships, homepage sponsorships, right? And it's, you know, buy it for two weeks, buy it for a month. Uh, we actually, we use the technology that goes in and segments that audi audience in real time and then delivers the most appropriate message to those users. 
Um, and that's still, it's, it's bought on a fixed price, right? It's not bidded, it has nothing to do with that, uh, but it's a way to programmatically, um, in, in essence, in that case, it's really about audience segmentation and creative delivery, but it's just using those same technologies, using big data in smarter ways that has nothing to do with real-time bidding and exchanges. So less about, less about uh, programmatic buying, more about, um, you know, uh, call it dy dy dynamic creation of creatives? Dynamic messaging, is that accurate? Um, it, that's an output of it. Uh -huh. We look at it as the, what we really use it for is the audience segmentation. The, gotcha. And the output would be mm -hmm. different messaging. Yeah. Um, but it is delivering that you know, in real time, slicing up that audience. You, you, you had said, uh, you, John Gray, uh, had said it was about 15 months ago um, that the programmatic approach uh, had yet to make it to the CMO. Um, fast forward 15 months, where does the idea of uh, programmatic um, buying or the application that you just referred to, uh, where, where does that sit in the organization? How um, uh, p p pervasive is that in the conversation with the, with, with the chiefs of marketing? Um, it, it's it's pretty high up there now. I, I don't know that you know across our, our clients that you know every CMO every CMO would know that some dig way into the details, um, right. some don't don't want to know all the details. They certainly know, uh, you know, philosophically agree with the notion of using as much technology and data as we can to get smarter and smarter about you know how we place buys and how we message to consumers, um, and and you know they they. Look, the good ones are voracious readers of all the trades, and so this stuff is definitely, you know, up on their radar. So um, on that, I, I don't, honestly, I don't think they really know or care. Um, I, I, <laughs> the CMO. Yeah, I mean, honestly, the, I don't know that they need to. I think that them knowing helps them not get taken advantage of by media partners as well as their media agencies, and I'm speaking generally, not for GM. Um, but I, I, I don't know any executives that, that necessarily, unless they're digital, that sit around and walk around and start talking about DSPs, DMPs, trading, anything. I mean, that's not something that's even necessarily on their radar. I think what they are interested in is efficiency and making sure that you get good ROI on that spend. And so they love that concept, I think. But a lot of you know, people in those positions, they, they came up under the traditional arm of marketing. And so this is kind of new territory for them and it's up to us to help translate for them. But I think this is where, and even getting back to some of the previous conversation, you know, as a marketer, it's a lot of what we're talking about is display and efficiency and making sure we're getting relevant messaging out there. Um, I, you can be amazingly efficient. I mean, physically, you can be amazingly efficient, but then you spend all evening on the toilet, right? So it's really important that what you develop, and I think what we're missing here with big data and what we're learning about consumers is the front end of it, if you rewind all the way to what types of content are you developing, and what kinds of experience are you giving people, and I'm not just saying on a banner, I'm saying beyond the banner into the actual content integrations or different partnerships that you have with media partners. It's not just about slapping really efficient banners up there to try and entice people to come to your content. So using big data and using all those variables and understanding understanding who that consumer is and who that segment is, and then developing relevant content to them as well as creative, I think that is really important. I think that that's a lot of times what we miss out on in the, in the name of efficiency. So you, you talk about efficiency. Uh, I think it's a, a logical segue to, uh, you know, the, I don't know if that's a, um, a, a euphemism for performance, uh, but I think to a degree it probably is. Yes, no? Maybe? Sure. Okay, good, because uh, that helps me. Um, so we talk about, in our business, it's all about, uh, it's often all about performance. Uh, uh, we talk about uh, key performance indicators, lower funnel activities, offline sales, whatever it may be. Um, is there a, a, a common end goal uh, that we as digital marketers are trying to achieve either on behalf of our clients or ourselves if we are the client, um, that data allows us to take that sort of like next step towards? Is, is, there, is there a way to sort of sum up what the ultimate goal is that we're trying to achieve? 
So I think these guys probably would be able to speak to it better as the actual clients. From, from what I see as clients using our DMP, I think the end goal is, you know, for a marketer, the ROI on I'm making an investment in advertising, and then how is that line up with the purchases? And, and DataLogix probably can do a really good job at, at analyzing this for the clients, and I think you do have some products that do that. Shameless plug for you. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I really think it's, it's just looking at, especially in the online space, the, the biggest thing that, you know, I've heard from CPG clients all the time is, you know, they want to put money into the digital advertising, but they don't know how it really relates to the offline purchases that occur, what you guys said, 90% of the time. Uh, so in that situation, it's tying those two together. And I guess the good news is uh, we're kind of there as an industry, as, as you know, referenced by Data Logix, and, and, and a lot of tying the, the information together from offline to online is the capabilities there. Um, you know, we're able to do that. Data Logix is able to do that. I'm sure a lot of other companies are able, are able to do that. And I think that's really where the industry is going, but that's my opinion. One other thing I want to mention about performance, it's a pet peeve of mine. I think performance is one of those buzzwords that's way too vague. Um, a per performance, even on the previous question, what is performance? So does BT work in perform, you know, for performance? Well, what are you looking to do? Are you looking to get a click, a conversion, a lead, or are you just looking for brand lift? Um, so uh, we've, you know, previously, uh, before we were a data management platform, actually in between being data management platforms, we were an ad network, and we did a lot of brand lift studies. And we saw BT worked all the time in brand lift studies. So it, it definitely works for certain types of performance. These guys have more details on it as to the different conversions and that kind of stuff. But I can say that, that, you know, just real quick, performance, we need to define that sometimes because I think it's way too vague. So, yeah, I, I guess I don't think they're, um, I don't think, you know, I, I would agree with Doug. I don't think by any stretch there is a set of standards that, that has emerged that is the correct set of standards, right? So I think, and I think it's a complicated problem. If you, going back to the, the CMO question and the prior question, if you're a CEO or a CMO, it's a really easy answer. My, my marketing investment is there to drive sales, and, and that's on my P&L. That, that's an easy question. But come down even to very senior people, like the Johns over here, right, who are responsible for massive media dollars. That question, and you guys, obviously, I'm not, I don't want to speak for you, but the question becomes much more nuanced, right, to claim, you know, so data logics, I think, uniquely can, can tie now online impressions to the sale of offline vehicles. But, but claiming true causality, claiming that seeing that, that display ad, that, that news feed ad in Facebook, we're working on a lot of these problems with Facebook right now, and we were talking to John about them today, very challenging, very challenging to cause, very challenging to claim causality, right? And, and so I wouldn't, I know, by the way, and, and so I say this is real, I know how, when I say I, I mean not me, but my team knows how to, to, knows how to prove that an online ad, whether an online ad drove sales of toothpaste or a can of soup. We know how to do that now. We know how to say whether it drove someone to buy a sweater at Macy's or buy a, a, a thing of laundry detergent at, at, um, at Walmart. We don't know yet how to prove that a vehicle was sold to a specific group of people based on the ads they saw. But what we do know how to do, that, so this is where the current state of the art is in terms of offline sales. What we do know how to do, and what we've proven repeatedly now, is to say these people who were shown the ads did or did not buy cars at a higher or lower rate in the 15, 30, 45, 90 days afterwards. How do you do that? I'll answer yours because Peter didn't finish this. That's an easy <laughs> one. But um, uh, so the way that we do it is by is by working with Polk Automotive, who's our partner, and we, um, you know, without getting into all the details, we we have a an online match process where we where we have the ability to target audiences or measure audiences that other people have targeted, and then post campaign we can actually work with Polk and pull through auto registration data and actually see how that ties into a significant number of the impressions served. In some cases, 70% plus of impressions served in a campaign. So we can show now, you know, this, so the, the earlier question about does context matter can be answered in what I would call a black box mode, which is 
we all have opinions about whether context matter, and isn't like everything else, the answer is yes, sometimes. Does the offer matter? Yes. Does creative matter? Yes. Does the audience you read matter? Yes. But ultimately, if you can prove whether the people you're reaching um, bought more product as a result, then those questions get answered for themselves with data. But again, I'd say we're a long way from being able to prove that in the automotive space. But I think you're going to see we couldn't do what we're doing now. No one could a year ago and two years ago and three years ago. So I think you're going to see tremendous progress um, in partnership with, with the, uh, the, the big agencies and OEMs at trying to connect these dots better and better because it's really challenging. Yeah, it scares the heck out of me to optimize campaigns all the way to sales. Uh, and the reason why is I, I just don't, I don't want to redo what we did with leads, um, right. which we're still trying to you know, shake that hangover off. What, um, what, what does that mean? So, well, what I mean by that is, you know, if, if the easiest way to drive sales is to put cash on the hood, right? And a lot of the car companies did that for many, many years. And what they ended up doing was driving down the overall transaction price and values of their vehicles. Um, and it's this snowball effect. So um, it, it's actually, if you think about like online advertising for every, you know, million I might spend in, you know, uh, online advertising, I'm going to have, you know, many, many multiples times of that in uh, CNI, you know, cash on the hood, which is actually going to drive the sales. Um, and so I get really nervous about this notion of trying to get it all the way down to sale um, because I think we'll be ignoring what's incredibly important for a lot of our brands um, are things like favorable opinion. The other things that help you get higher transaction prices for your vehicles, uh, which ultimately will result in higher resale value and better pricing for consumers in the end. So to me, like, that way end point is a scary, scary scenario to, to try to like reverse engineer that exact thing to, to hope that we're going to have that, you know, perfect science. Um, I also know that if you, if you understand enough about, you know, how the dealers work and, and how that world is, um, I mean, a consumer can come in wanting uh, an escape, say in, in Ford's instance, and depending on what inventory is available and those types of things, they could walk out with an Explorer or something mm -hmm. very, very different. Um, so there's so many things that happen between what that consumer intends to purchase and what they actually purchase um, that, that that possibility freaks me out just a little bit. Well, so the only thing, just to complete the triple play of people who, the three people who probably shouldn't be comment, commenting on this, right, is attribution is a client side problem. And it is a problem, right? You are the only people that have visibility into everything that you're doing from a marketing perspective across all platforms, online, offline, whatever. We can help bring a lot of signals back to you that uh, continue to inform that. But the, the direct line of causality, exactly to your point, if that's not what you guys are most valued, but that's an input to everything else that we're doing, we need to continue to innovate on that, whether it's viewability or, um, or brand surveys or, or whatever, we need to continue to innovate to bring you more inputs. But the attribution across all your marketing mix, that's on you guys. And we can help you as much as we can. But for us to sit here and tell you, you know, what the overall attribution looks like for the gazillion dollars that you guys put out there in the market, it, it's, um, to your point, it's, it's a little bit myopic. And I think, and not to say that there's not value in tying it yeah. to sales. I just, right. it, you know, we did, um, when I was at, at JWT a long time ago, we, with Ford, did the Exmo study proved the link of online advertising to sales and its relation to offline media and all those things. I mean, that really sort of broke open at that time um, the, the digital budgets and sort of the, it broke through the mindset of, you know, the, the higher ups within the marketing organizations that digital can actually have an impact. Um, so there's a role for these things, um, you know, so I don't want to say that, you know, don't do those things because, you know, when planned strategically and done well, they absolutely uh, can be an important, you know, sort of tool. It's a lot more information than you had before. And we're going to continue to innovate on that for exactly that reason. And, and automotive is absolutely the most difficult vertical to do this in, right? Given the small number of units that move, how long consideration cycles, the amount spent on mass media, all these kinds of things. Yeah, so I think you've got a, you've got a toolkit, right, that is comprised reach, online engagement, some level of brand resonance, what we're focused on is bringing sales in, to, to, to John's point, as another important metric. But I think especially mm -hmm. in automotive, it needs to be considered as part of an arsenal as opposed to an uh, end in itself. 
Yeah, uh, John Gray, you, you had said, uh, answering the question, why do brands need a better way into display advertising? What's the problem been to date? Your answer was, and this was, uh, again, going back about 15 months, to date we haven't had a way to programmatically, and here we are kind of tying it all together, uh, to programmatically optimize towards attitudinal shift. Um, uh, is, is this important for exactly that reason? Uh, in the sense that, I mean, attitudinal shift, obviously it's important, uh, but it's pretty clear that the be-all, end-all is not being able to tie back an online impression to the actual purchase of a car. Um, you know, the concept of programmatically optimizing towards attitudinal shift, uh, what does it mean? Um, so actually that, that, that sort of concept was one that uh, a few of us came up with, I'm sure lots of people all across the country came up with it, but a few of us came up with it on a whiteboard um, when I was actually working on a CPG account and all of our campaigns were about introducing new products and generating awareness for mm -hmm. those new products. Uh, and I was getting really frustrated because people don't go to a site about hand lotion um, you know, you don't need to go to a site about hand lotion. You certainly don't submit leads for hand lotion. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of things. I was like, well, how the heck are we going to optimize these campaigns right. other than, you know, coverage models that because of the amount that we're investing, we couldn't take that coverage model, like if we convert it to an online GRP, we couldn't tie that back to sales. Um, and so we thought, well, if the objective really is awareness of this new product, why don't we measure that? Why don't we take... That, that survey response as a digital signal, and then, you know, instead of looking at a report six months after the campaign, why don't we get a little bit smarter about that and feed that digital signal into um, a system that can then go out and continue to buy against those audiences that, um, that have a higher likelihood to, uh, to have an increase. So by me asking that question is proof that context actually matters because I, was act uh, I read it out of context. So I think there's something interesting in that whole thing. I think technologically, it's actually really challenging other than doing surveys, like at the moment of impression or you know, shortly after based off of cookie data or whatever. Um, I think technologically, it's interesting to do that because that type of sentiment data and, and some of the brand attitudinal lifts typically happen in the social space. And a lot of that data is what we call unstructured data. It's just kind of blah. You know, I, I love my Chevrolet Malibu because X, Y, and Z, and it's all unstructured. It's just kind of out there. And what we can pull all of that information in, but there's a process that has to happen where you actually structure that data, and you whether it's through keywords and all sorts of analysis that happens. But doing that in real time is really challenging. I think that's one of the biggest challenges because Candidly, the servers can't do that. There are processes that, hap that have to happen in advance to filter that information before you can actually do that in real time. So I think that's where social nuance comes into it. And I think in a lot of instances, just because somebody says, yeah, I loved your product on a survey, that doesn't necessarily get to the true feelings or brand lift or sentiment about that product. So I think it's really important that that's where you start looking at what's happening in the social space and adding that nuance to it. But again, that takes a human. And that's, that's something that we as marketers, we need to take into consideration. We can change topics a little bit, uh, talk about um, uh, cross-platform. Um, in an Ad Exchanger article uh, titled, Polk Execs Price and McBride See Offline Data Measuring Online Activity. Uh, John McBride from Polk had stated that no one yet had, and this was uh, going back towards the end of uh, 2011, so we're talking uh, you know, t t 10 months ago, uh, no one yet had the ability to look at attribution across channels. Um, has that changed? Uh, are, are, are we, whether it be CPG or whether it be autos, are we now, uh, do we now have the ability to look at attribution across channels? Where does mobile fit into the mix? Uh, where does video, uh, the other questions, but from an attribution standpoint, are we able to look at it across channels? The attribution debate aside, right? The, yes, <laughs> whatever attribution. Whatever that means. Right. Um, I, a, better, a, be, a better way to look, are, are we able to tie uh, an impression, uh, call it sequencing, uh, from, from display to mobile yeah. to, to interactive TV? Yeah, so Yahoo's in a unique position, uh, we think, to, to start to try to tackle this problem. We have some components of it today, um, but given the fact that we see users, registered users across multiple devices today, we are able to start to look at 
what someone sees on, on mobile, what's, what they see in video, what they see in display, what they see on their tablet. Um, it's going to be a huge focus as we start to bring um, what we're doing with genome in terms of everything we know about users and start to try to sequence it across multiple devices in real time. Uh, but that's a huge focus. Um, maybe two of the clients, the Johns, I guess as we're calling them, um, might have a perspective. But I think the answer is no, nobody's totally solved that yet. Uh -huh. You guys don't like that? No, it's fine. It's fine. All right. Um, <laughs> um, but I think, um, I think that's the next real piece of it. And I think Yahoo, for, uh, for, for starters, is in a very unique position to start to tie users I know who you are on your mobile device. I know exactly who you are on display. And I think that's, a, that's something that we're very interested in, in trying to bring to market in a little bit more of a cohesive way than we have uh, to date. So uh, we actually can do that. Uh, so at Lodomy, we actually have the capability of, of, of doing that right now. Uh, we have a couple of our clients, don't think I can share their names, um, who are actually doing sequential targeting. They're testing out sequ sequential targeting cross-platform, um, mobile, desktop, tablet, um, that's the gist right now. Eventually, it's probably going to go into the TV, interactive TV space. Um, the way that we're doing it, because I'm sure everyone's kind of curious, um, you have to be able to pass in a unique ID. So we've created uh, kind of a new uh, tag. Everything's based off of you know, dropping tags or firing tags. We've created a new tag where you can pass in a unique ID, and then we actually can bring everything together within our platform. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess there is probably a bigger discussion, but I'll just say that the capabilities are already there. It's not 100%. There are issues like let's just say, um, you know, with, with iPhone, you can't drop a cookie. So, again, passing in an ID or how you fire the tag, th there are intricacies to it. But moral of the story is we already, we already have clients who are testing this out and, and, and doing it. Um, I think that's what's interesting, well, one interesting part about this is cookie shelf life and how long cookies are actually valid for. And a lot of what we're talking about is so dependent on cookies. So when you're talking about, I think some companies, and to answer your question, I don't think we are there yet, but, um, and I'm, when I say we, I say we as marketers, not yeah, but um, it's something that I think we all want to get toward. There's concepts of cookie householding and there are certain players that are doing it or, you know, experimenting it with it right now. I think Google has a really unique position here too because, you know, you buy an Android phone, you log in with your, you know, Google Plus ID because now when you log into YouTube, it's Google Plus and when you log in, you know, everything's starting to connect. I think they're uniquely positioned there, Google TV. I think Apple is really positioned in an interesting place there as well because it's not necessarily about cookies as much anymore. Uh, Facebook has an interesting approach there. They're not necessarily, they know a lot about you without you know, cooking every single page that you go to. It's based off of login. So, um, I don't know. I don't think we're there yet, but I think there are some uh, clear people that are moving in that direction. I don't know that they've connected all of those dots as seamlessly as you'd like to think. So, so just to, to be clear, I, I agree. I, I think on a holistic manner we haven't, but to, to John's point, there are, so we work you know, with all, really, we work with everyone in the, in the space from publishers to networks to agencies to marketers, but uh, there are some of those who have those login information across platform to where they are able to pass in, that in and we are able to join it. Um, so so uh, on a holistic manner, probably not, to, you know, to John's point. And also, yeah, you're right about the, the companies that you named, they have a potential to do it in, in a much more global fashion. I'm talking more from an individual client standpoint you're able to do it at some capacity. Eric, Eric you, had, uh, you had said earlier this year that uh, Data Logics was in the R&D phase for addressable TV and that you expected more to happen uh, this year in 2012. Um, anything that you can expand on? Yeah, it's still, um, I think it's still pretty early days. We made our first kind of move into bridging the, um, the gap between, I actually think what's really interesting, and it's interesting that nobody mentioned it when you talked about Cross media addressabilities. Nobody mentioned that little sixty-five billion dollar area of broadcast TV, right? So if you if you're gonna talk about attribution, we probably need to in conclude that in the mix. And so um, I, I think we've actually become really interested in broadcast TV and what are the commonalities as we think about again our kind of unique role in bridging offline to online. And so we announced uh, a couple months ago a, a partnership with TiVo which lets people buy actually TV viewers what, wherever they are online. So you can kind of buy in a programmatic sense online audiences who have 
watch Mad Men or Monday Night Football or, or whatever the case may be. And so I think that's, that's kind of our first straddle at bridging the world. So I, be, I guess since I said that, I've become much more enamored by the idea of how can broadcast TV and, and digitally addressable media, which are tending not to be TV. And just disclaimer here, I started working in, in the digital media space in 1996, building out the first commercial video on demand system. And you know, it, it just, this stuff is moving really, really slowly. And I like, I like online stuff. It tends to move a lot faster than addressable TV, so. Uh, I, 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 I'd like to set it up at some point for us to be able to, to, to offer the audience uh, the opportunity to ask some questions. Um, I don't know if we're gonna do it by, by like note card or whether we're gonna raise our hands, but what I'll do is I'll ask a couple more questions uh, and then we'll turn it over to the audience. Um, uh, John Beebe, you, you had said, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to catch you off guard. Uh, <laughs> I'm freezing. <laughs> Borrow my jacket. Uh, you had said, uh, you said in five to, this was in the ARF Live, uh, ARF Research Now Live conference, you had said in five to ten years, people won't go to websites, information will come to them. Uh, it's happening now on mobile. Mobile will be your passport to the world. Um, what does that mean? It's a good idea for a new business. Um, no, I think, um, I, you know, especially with global top-level domains coming out and everybody's interest in buying all of these domains and different, you know, w, or not, you don't even need www, my God, you just, you know, whatever you buy. Um, I, I think there's an interesting trend that's happening where because of mobile devices and because of the information that's constantly coming into your mobile devices in real time, a lot, for a lot of information and a lot of um, life choices or just even contacts or your sports scores or um, restaurant reviews or tweets and all that's just coming directly to the palm of your hand, you're not necessarily going to sites as much anymore. Um, and I don't know that five to ten years is you know, accurate, I hope it is, um, because I don't know that people are necessarily going to be going in and typing www.chevrolet.com anymore. I think that type of information, if we know that they're in market and we know enough about them and we're able to connect a lot of dots, in an ideal world, I'd love to go to the ballpark, they know what seat I'm in, they know that I drink a certain type of beer, they know that I like ketchup and mustard on my hot dog, I hit a button and it comes. They already know all of my transactional history, they know all of that information. I think that's where we're headed. Um, I don't know that five to ten years is an accurate um, time frame for that, uh, but I don't know that we always had to go to sites to get information anymore, and I think, especially with the apps that we have on our phones, I'm not going to get into a whole app versus site thing, but I think it's just becoming a norm. Stuff is coming to us constantly, and we don't necessarily have to search for it anymore. It's just expected to be there. It's actually, there is, um, I don't even know if he still works at AOL, but Ted Leonsis. Sure. Uh, I remember he did a 313 digital ad craft talk and it might have been about five years ago and he, he mentioned that notion of marketing to the algorithm um, because that's how marketers were going to have to think about it. You market to the algorithm because that's what was going to deliver the content uh, to the end user because they aren't going to be out there searching for it as much. It's going to just start coming to them, um, which is sort of along the lines of that same vein. I have no idea what will happen in 10 years. I mean. Nobody predicted Facebook 10 years ago or anything else. So he, He's now the owner of the, uh, like the, the, the best hockey team in the NHL, the Caps, right? Uh, sorry, sorry. I know, sorry. Yeah, nobody's, nobody's laughing at my jokes tonight. Come on. Uh, I know we probably have a lot of Red Wings fans here. Um, all right, we have a few questions. Thank you. Uh, a few questions that came from the audience. Um, uh, let me see here. Uh, isn't all, all this data based on people signing into Yahoo? Uh, uh, I can't. Uh, yes, all the data is based on Yahoo. <laughs> Every, all of it. Um, I can't read that one, so I will apologize. Yeah, why don't we do that? Why don't we uh, open it up to questions? Raise your hand if you have any questions. We'll bring a mic to you, and I'll figure out which questions are legible. Anybody have any questions? Let's just end with that. <laughs> yeah. All the data comes from Yahoo. Yeah, hi guys. Um, I just had a quick question. You guys talked about context, and um, I think it gets closer to the idea of psychology and uh, emotion, and was wondering your thoughts on wh where do you see emotion and psychology um, being integrated into big data, um, and how do you do you see that being separated and 
as well. Because I, I have a friend who uh, actually has a company who is starting to study um, the psychological ramifications behind people on, online and what they're doing, why they're doing what they're doing, why they're getting addicted. There was actually an article in Newsweek about people, why they were getting addicted to Facebook and other social um, sites. So I'm just wondering how do you, because I feel like that, that piece of the puzzle is so much more important than data because you, know, you can look at someone's Facebook page and learn everything about them, but that doesn't really tell you about the person and it doesn't tell you what they're gonna buy and, and what they're not gonna buy. So I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll jump on that. Um, so I think it depends on how you think of data. So we think of data as a signal. And so if there's a signal that's accurate um, about that type of emotion, then that, that's how, at least that's how I would think about it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that you can't characterize emotion via data. Um, and I think, in fact, you know, I, at one point I thought Facebook's mission was to try to figure out what made you happy, right? Uh, so they could make you more addicted to that experience and thereby make you spend more time on it. Um, so I think there's probably some people there that might disagree with the notion that you can't use data signals um, to sort of understand emotions and what drives emotion. Um, I'm not sure if that was exactly getting at what your question was. Um, but, it, you know, it, it certainly you can use data to uncover emotion and what is the importance of that would sort of ultimately go back to, again, what you're trying to do. And so, as marketers, one thing we try to do is drive favorable opinion um, and that is an attitudinal or emotional um, sentiment. And so we do use data and signal to measure what, those, uh, what that favorable opinion is. Yeah, so, so just real quick, I, I agree, I think that is data. I think that that is a piece of data. Data is a piece of information. So to John, John said that data may drive the emotion, but then once you know the emotion, that can feed back in as more data. Uh, and, and I think that we all agree that, that yeah, that can definitely be used in, in all types of efforts, in all types of analytics, but, but in any piece of data, and I consider that data, which I think John was saying too. Uh, I was able to de decipher this question, by the way. Uh, isn't all this data based on people signing into um, AOL or Yahoo uh, with accurate demos? I myself list my age as 100. So the question. I'd love to take that one. No. <laughs> no, it's not. I, there is, I think, um, there is, so there are co companies like Yahoo and Facebook and AOL that capture a lot more information about people at login. There are companies like Twitter that only capture an email address and that's it. And they rely on other companies, some of which may be represented on the panel, to provide them with information that has more reliable signal than un unverified self-reported online information. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll reinforce that for you, which is, um, which is the point I was making earlier. If you're, if you're, if you're only taking one signal, wherever it is, whether it's your Yahoo login or social data or one uh, you know, BT segment that you buy from whatever vendor, you're not getting enough signals. And you want to eliminate the false positives, right? You want, Yahoo spends a lot of time working with online and offline companies to you know, match up our data with uh, data that's available elsewhere so that we can get a more true um, picture of what that user looks like and we can eliminate bad data from, from the set, or we can at least minimize its ability to affect uh, any prediction that we're, that, that we're working on. So, if, yes, you're, it's, it's absolutely accurate though, right? If you only relied on what our logins were, I'm turning 29 next week, so. You and me both. Uh, here, here, here's a question uh, that I think is uh, very relevant to the folks on the panel. Uh, it sounds like everyone forgets the purchase funnel. What part of the funnel do you feel is the most important without cash on the hood? No part. Anybody? Anybody have an opinion? I'll go. This will affect every RFP response you get for the next month. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, 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 we can go on to the next one. No, no, no. no. I, th I, think it's a, I think it's a great question because uh, it will let me rant on the purchase funnel a little bit. Um, so the, the purchase funnel... Uh, not to be maybe confused with what people think of as the purchase process as well. Um, 
it is not dead, and so there's lots of people, and I don't know if you were, whoever asked the question thinks that we're saying that in some way. Um, the purchase process is not linear. It is completely sort of different than it used to be, especially given lots of digital resources. The purchase funnel, as people think of it, is really a cognitive model for how people take in information and make decisions, and our brains haven't really changed all that much uh, since that was developed. I think that's you. Um, so Purchase Funnel still exists, uh, and your comms objectives that are tied back to that funnel, like trying to raise awareness or generate favorable opinion, um, are all dependent on the products that, um, that you're trying to market, right? So you know, I'll give you a great example. Like when you say what, if the question was what stage is more important, um, you know, we're launching a new vehicle, C-Max, which you know, relative to something like Mustang or F-150 has no awareness at all. Um, and so for us, you know, one would naturally think that we'll be paying more attention to generating some awareness, right? Um, and there's different challenges for everybody. So it's not a one size fits all question. Uh, for me, and this is a personal opinion, I'm a huge upper funnel guy. I love it. Um, I love doing crazy shit online. Um, because I think it's the most sexy and it's the funnest. But you know what? At the end of the day, to keep your job, you, you better have your stuff together on the lower end of the funnel. And, and, but the thing, I think as automotive, we've really mastered the bottom end of the, of the funnel as far as we think, you know, based off of leads at least or other, you know, key performance indicators. Um, I think we've done a great job optimizing to that. What I do think big data, everybody just assumes we're going to apply it to in-market or even consideration sets, but I think it also has some application to the upper end of the funnel as well. I think it's really important to understand cultural nuance too. Uh, getting back to the, uh, the psychology question, I think you have to take that into consideration as you're developing creative content at the upper end of the funnel. So it's all important, you know, if I say the bottom end isn't important, somebody would shoot me, right? But, uh, you know, I think some parts are sexier and funnier or fun to work with. Do you have any other questions from the crowd? I can't really see. Looks like there's one over there. Hey guys, this is Rachel Hazy from Millennial Media. I just had a quick question. Um, the discussion primarily has been on uh, online data, and I'm just wondering how you guys um, are evaluating mobile um, in that same sense. Obviously, there's lots of discussion. I know we've talked about broadcast as well, so quite a few mediums out there and how you're kind of evaluating the, the mobile perspective of it as well. Um, I can't go into specific detail of how we're looking at mobile or what value we're putting to it, other than I can say in general, I think a lot of us would say it's uber important, especially because um, at least in the role I'm in and with my colleagues here, we're looking at it from a global perspective and in some uh, areas of the world, mobile is their first information device. So we absolutely are taking it into consideration. I can't go into detail as far as how we're doing it or how we're looking at it, but we are looking at it at the same time alongside tablet, alongside you know, our, our sites. Um, it's absolutely important to have that information in there. I think it's a different type of interaction and in our expectations and our, I wanna say, activities that what we expect from our media purchase there are a little bit different. And I think we need to align ourselves as marketers to understand the difference of what people are doing on mobile versus a big browser. I do think it's shifting and evolving, but um, it is absolutely something that's on our radar. We look at it all the time. I don't think we're focused on online. Um, I think we're talking about the data, which is independent of the delivery channel. Um, so maybe we're giving a lot more examples uh, that relate to like display advertising, but you shouldn't be confused by that at all. We're talking about the actual data itself, which is completely separate from where you actually deliver messaging. Mobile, obviously, it's kind of a truism has a lot of unique challenges and, and opportunities, right? The whole notion of it's much more likely to be a second screen than a big screen is. So you're watching TV and on your mobile device. The whole location overlay is really exciting if, if you're a data geek. You have a you know much tougher form factor to get people emotional with because it's much smaller. Um, and then the, the kind of ubiquity of cookies online is really challenged in the mobile environment for a whole bunch of reasons, which I won't go into. 
So the bottom line is data is every bit as important for, for mobile, but the use of, I think the use and application of, you know, if we're going to go back to the term big data on mobile is much, much earlier. But it's going to be every bit as important, different attributes, different ways of applying it, et cetera. I actually think, sort of maybe to add on that, it's, I think it's fascinating because you have another sense, you have touch, um, yeah, and you, you didn't have, an, you didn't have yeah, that sense point. to measure before. Um, and so, yes, from a data perspective, you know, getting that touch data and understanding, you know, how, how that applies to what we're trying to do for marketing um, is fascinating. Very early days. So I think that about wraps it up. Uh, it looks like she got one more there. Oh, sorry. I have one more question. Uh, uh, let's see the opening of the Facebook exchange. Well, how, how, how do you all... How, how do you, if at all, see the opening of the Facebook exchange changing the landscape? We'll finish with that question. Facebook exchange. I have no comment. <laughs> I'll, if no one wants to touch it, I mean, I'll take it. Um, I think it's, it's, it's really interesting, and I think even Facebook doesn't know exactly how this is going to play out right now. But you have effectively a, an environment that, that represents about 40% of online impressions that are different than standard IAB units that is being, um, you know, at least partially opened up to a greater degree than the really, you know, walled garden it's been in so far. And um, in our close work with Facebook over the year to, to um, do kind of detailed campaign measurement and now to, to begin targeting, which is starting. I think it's going to be. It's, I think it's going to be really, really interesting. Um, if we get back to the cross-media measurement, you know, there are debates about whether social is a different medium or not than display overall. But I think the ability for people to, for, to come out of its walled garden and be held accountable in the same way that that other uh, digital media um, is are will will rise the tide for everybody. I think. So I'm not going to represent GM in any way on this, but I do find it fascinating the double click integration onto that because that actually yeah. really is interesting between Facebook and Google. That dynamic will be fascinating to watch. Yeah. As a as a remote third party. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess uh, I'd like to thank the panelists. Uh, I thought it was a very interesting panel. And, uh, All right, we want to thank you too, Jeff. Uh, you did a great job. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you uh, to the panel. It was great.